I never imagined betrayal could cut this deep. She was my everything, my beautiful wife. But behind her angelic smile lay secrets. I caught her with them, their lies unraveling before my eyes. The anger, the pain, it consumed me, I wanted revenge, needed it. Confronting her lover, my rage knew no bounds. Our once happy home became a battlefield of deceit and broken promises. This is the story of how love turned into vengeance. This is my story. The end of one life, and the change of another happened in just a few seconds. One second, Tyson glares at his wife, Imani, who sits in the passenger seat. He already regrets the hurtful words he just said. Two seconds, Tyson sees something big and dark moving fast outside her window, just as Imani's angry face turns to him. Three seconds, crashes too hard to feel, and too many to count, sounds too loud to hear, flashes of light and dark, pain mixed with numbness, too much of both. Some unknown seconds later, Tyson wakes to see stars through tall grass, cold water from the ditch, soaking his torn clothes. Pain comes back strong and he knows she's gone. No, no, no. Tyson bolts up from his pillow gasping for breath. The nightmare shoves him awake, just like it has for the past five years. He feels phantom pain in his body, memories of the year he spent in the hospital, coming back. It was a long time of pushing through pain to make his body work again. Once his hands could hold, his arms could move, his feet could balance, and his legs could stand, he leaned into machines to replace mental pain with physical pain. He lost a lot of weight. It felt like peeling layers off as he searched for a reason to keep going. He was becoming someone new, but for what? His weakness turned into strength, yet he pushed even harder. He thought the pain was cleansing him, but it was really just avoiding his feelings. After a year of harsh exercise routines, the therapists only let him have short, supervised gym visits. This made him focus on grief counseling. He had to face the sadness he tried to bury in pain. It took eight more months before the doctors felt he was ready to go home. Oh, sugar, is that bad dream back again? Her voice was so familiar, it's so out of place. Tyson's heart clenched every time he heard it, but he stayed silent. He had fought his way out of the darkness while in the hospital. His new life's foundation was his sharp mind. He wouldn't give that up now. Imani was dead. She was gone. She wasn't at the end of his bed, slender and fit in her silk nightgown, her curly hair waiting for his touch, her milk chocolate skin begging to be felt, her soft brown eyes full of love and care. Tyson lay back on his pillow, closing his eyes and rubbing his face. He went through his equations in his head, and when he got the answer he opened his eyes. As always, she was gone. The doctors used lots of confusing words to talk about his feelings, the crash, and his thoughts about his mother. Survivor's guilt and post-traumatic stress disorder were the main ones, but there were many others he didn't remember. He never told the doctors about Amani's visits at night. If he had, he might still be in the hospital. It was easier to accept these moments and move on. Besides, he had his love for math to bring logic back to his mind. She started appearing to him at night after he began pushing himself hard in his physio sessions. As he lay in bed, muscles aching, he imagined her visiting him. From the start, he knew to keep quiet about it. He learned more about it when he got home. He read a lot about how the mind deals with losing someone you love, especially after a bad accident. His refusal to accept her death, shown by his cries when he woke up, meant his mind was looking for ways to fill that hole in his life. Where only emptiness existed, his mind filled it with her. Five years was a long time to live with these visions, but like his chosen solitude and strict daily routine, he found comfort in the familiar. Maybe he wasn't ready to move on. As it always did after the nightmare, his mind went back to the night of the party. Tyson didn't even want to go. It was a Manny who insisted they go, saying they had to show up because the man had been so supportive. He was the one who helped Tyson become a professor of advanced math at the local university. That's what the man said, at least. Tyson knew it was the dean's wife who made it happen. The party was to celebrate the dean's retirement. Franklin Dunnings was stepping down and looking forward to a cozy life in a beach town in some Central American country. Tyson, Imani, his colleagues and their spouses were all at his home for one last party before he and his wife started this new chapter of their lives. Tyson wasn't sure if this new plan was what his old friend really wanted. Ashley Dunnings, formerly Ashley Collins, had lived next door to Tyson since he could remember. They went from kindergarten to college together as best friends, until Tyson's talent with numbers took him away to learn from the best at several universities around the world. When he finally came back, he found out he had missed his best friend's wedding. He was happy to be home and happy that Ashley had found her true love, so he drank a bit too much, fell down some stairs, and ended up in the hospital where Amani worked. She met the smart guy who couldn't handle five steps, and his heart started to beat for her. On the night of the party, guests noticed Ashley wasn't there, 
and it was strange because she was always the life of the party. Franklin made excuses for her and told everyone to keep having fun, but without Ashley's bright personality, it wasn't the same. Tyson wanted to leave. He never really liked Franklin and didn't mind that he had left the university. And then he seemed more relaxed at this party than usual. Tyson thought it might be because Ashley wasn't there. He had noticed some tension between Amani and Ashley before. About 90 awkward minutes later, Ashley stormed into the party, looking like she was full of anger and hurt. For a small woman with beautiful blonde hair, she made quite an entrance. Everyone could see she had been drinking and crying. Tyson shared a worried glance with Amani. Ashley shouted out that her husband was having an affair with a young student. She had just come back from a detective's office with photos to prove it. Franklin came back from the cellar with more drinks just as the shouting started. The fight was loud and painful to watch, and Franklin finally stormed out of the house. Ashley collapsed, crying her heart out. Tyson went to help her while Amani made sure the guests left. The party was over, and so was Franklin and Ashley's marriage. Tyson carried Ashley to her bed. Her blonde hair spread out on the pillow. Their eyes met and she kissed him, wrapping her arms around his neck. For a moment, he let it happen. Then he gently pulled away, shaking his head. The chance to be more than friends was over. Ashley turned away and cried softly. When he stepped into the hallway, Imani was waiting. He looked at her, feeling sad for his friend, but then he saw the anger in her eyes. She handed him a tissue and pointed at his mouth. He wiped his lips and saw the lipstick. She's drunk. You're not. I'm leaving, Amani said sharply, walking away and out the door. He quickly followed her, afraid of what she really meant. As they drove home, he felt her staring at him. She kissed me by surprise, he said quietly. Silence. His anger started to rise. He hadn't done anything wrong. Yes, Ashley had once been special to him, but that was in the past. What did you want me to do, turn my back on a friend who was falling apart? He shouted. Is she just a friend? The lipstick says something else, and Manny replied with a sting in her voice. I told you, she caught me off guard. Her marriage just fell apart, and she was hurting. She reached out for comfort. And of course it had to be you, and Manny yelled back. He took a deep breath, trying to stay calm. What do you have against Ashley? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because she's after the man who promised to be my faithful husband, she said coldly. I have never broken that promise and never will, he shot back. As they drove along the dark road, he could hear Amani trying to regain her composure. I see how she looks at you whenever there's a party, she said quietly, but with bitterness. She doesn't know when to stop. It him hard. At that moment, he felt like he didn't really know the woman sitting next to him. The woman he had loved from the day they met in the hospital. The woman he had promised to be true to for life. They had been together through ups and downs, her turning fifty just a month ago and his three years before. He had looked forward to growing old with her. As he stared at the road ahead, he wondered if he really knew her at all. His mind wandered to the parties at the hospital and homes of her co-workers. He knew Amani was well-liked and respected, but sometimes he saw men giving her looks and felt a twinge of insecurity. Yet she always touched base with him at these events and gave him a little kiss in front of everyone. He hadn't called her out for such moments. Why was she so angry about Ashley? Suddenly, his mouth moved before his brain. The difference is, I don't act with Ashley the way you do with Dr. Devin Wilson. Dr. Wilson was the hospital's chief surgeon. Tall, fit, smart, and single, he was the most eligible bachelor around. It seemed there was something he wasn't good at. As Tyson watched her turn to face him, he saw her anger. But there was something else in her eyes. Was it doubt? Or maybe guilt? And suddenly, they were on the tracks. No, Tyson shouted, pressing his hands against his eyes to push the memories away. He needed to get up, start his day, follow his routine. Patterns brought him peace. Christy Taylor was having a bad day even though Fridays were supposed to be good. She frowned, and people around her quickly noticed. She knew she was beautiful. She was lucky to be born with good looks, but she worked hard to make the most of it. She used the best skincare products to keep her skin perfect. She followed a strict diet with healthy foods to stay fit. She went to the gym to keep her body in shape. She also went to the salon every week to keep her long, wavy blonde hair shiny and her nails in the latest style. Her friends thought she should become a model, because she had the looks and the height but that wasn't her dream. She looked at her hand to admire her deep red nail polish and saw the diamonds on her engagement ring. Once, looking at it made her happy. Today, she felt nothing. Her fiancé, Blake Carlington, was handsome, fit, well-connected, and came from a rich family like hers. But over their eight months of engagement, she realized there was no magic between them. No sparks. Even being close to him didn't make her happy. 
Lately, nothing in her life brought her joy. She kept up her appearance and stayed stylish, but even shopping felt dull. Christy wasn't a fool. She hadn't gotten this far just because of her looks and social standing. She was smart and knew how to use her brain. She was doing well in most of her classes and had hoped to graduate at the top of her class. But recently, everything seemed less important. Now she had to meet with Professor Haley, her math teacher, because her grades were dropping. She needed the math credit to move to the next year, but even the fear of falling behind didn't worry her. The emptiness in her life was taking away the meaning of everything. Still, she had to keep up appearances. Christy knocked on the office door and heard a voice telling her to come in. She entered a room filled with paper. Professor George Haley's office made him look like someone who didn't want to use computers. He liked working with paper for his math problems. But for the students' work, the university made him use digital tools, though he used paper as much as he could. Christy saw a short, stout man with wild white hair and a thick mustache sitting behind his desk. He looked up and smiled at her. Ah, Miss Taylor, how can I help you? He asked, blinking at her. She twirled a strand of her blonde hair and said, You wanted to talk to me about my grades. The professor nodded and pinched the bridge of his large nose. Yes, your grades are dropping. If you don't improve, I will have to fail you. Is there a test I can take to improve my grade? She asked. He gave her a serious look. Understanding the material will improve your grade. The next exam is very important for you. You need a strong understanding of the course content by then. She frowned again, knowing she had trouble with the last few chapters. I need a tutor. Yes, I was going to suggest the same, Haley said excitedly. I know a man who's a math genius and a natural teacher. To learn this material quickly, you need someone like him. Christy looked at the professor with some doubt. Is he here at the university? A sad look crossed the professor's face. No, he's not here anymore. He retired early. He looked straight at Christy. You need to understand how important it is to pass this course. You must convince him to tutor you. He seemed to think hard, then smiled a little. I'll give you a letter of introduction, but you must convince him. He grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and started writing. If he's such a good teacher, why did he retire early? Christy asked, curious about this mysterious genius. Haley folded the letter and sealed it in an envelope. He wrote something on the outside and handed it to her. Christy's eyes widened when she saw the name. Tyson Kane, the man who stopped the terrorists. Stop. Don't mention that event to him or his role in it. He lost his wife that night and doesn't need reminders. He pointed to a picture on the wall of a thick-bodied man with a beard, standing with his arm around a beautiful woman with curly hair. All Tyson needs to remember is that he loves teaching. The letter will help you meet him, but you must show him you're worth it. Christy stared at the professor, shocked and upset, while he looked puzzled. Are you saying I have to? What? No. Haley snapped angrily. Now Christy was the confused one. Haley took a deep breath. You need to show him that you have drive and ambition. Show him that his time won't be wasted on you. He does not respect people who just float through life. Show him you mean business and he'll teach you. If he agrees, you'll pass my class. Christy looked nervously at the envelope, feeling its importance. Go see him tomorrow. Do you have plans for Saturday morning? He asked. She shook her head. Thank you, Professor Haley, she said, nodding as she left his office. She decided to go to the library. She needed to find out all she could about Mr. Kane. This meeting was too important to mess up. George Haley sat down heavily in his chair as the pretty blonde left his office. He looked at the door, feeling guilty about the lie he wrote in the letter to his friend, Tyson. But he pushed that feeling away. A small lie was worth it if it could help Tyson come out of his shell. Tyson becoming a recluse at 58 was a waste of his talent. Christy didn't know that Tyson also despised aimless people but was turning into one himself. That made things clearer. If George believed in praying, he would pray that Christy could get Tyson to break out of his isolation. George grinned. It didn't hurt that Christy reminded him of Ashley when she was young. His smile faded as he thought of Ashley, who vanished the night of the dean's retirement party. At first, everyone thought Franklin did something terrible to her. But then they found out she left the country the next day. She took most of the money from their joint bank account and sent Franklin divorce papers through a law firm in New York. He signed them quickly, sold the house, and disappeared into the jungles of Central America. So Tyson's best friend was gone, just like his wife. George tried to fill the empty space, but couldn't reach Tyson. Maybe what Tyson needed was a woman's touch, and Christy had plenty of that. Tyson stood barefoot on the grass in his backyard, next to a small patio set he rarely used, except during his morning routine. He took out his big, 
cozy dressing gown and draped it over a chair. He then walked toward the lake, stopping at the small sandy beach by his property. He wasn't as hidden here, but no one had complained about his habit of swimming without clothes or sunbathing the same way. He didn't know if anyone was watching, and he didn't care. He stepped into the cold water, walking until he could dive in. The water was freezing, but he pushed through the pain until his body adjusted and his muscles warmed up. With so little body fat, he had to keep moving, or he'd sink like a stone. Each day he swam straight away from his home, until he felt tired. Then he would turn around and swim back. If he made it back, he'd have a great workout and more stamina. If he didn't make it back, it meant he gave all he had, and the lake would take him. Would today be that day? Three miles south of the university town was a beautiful lake surrounded by thick woods. On the northern edge of the lake was a three-mile road with twenty small homes. The rest of the lake was surrounded by steep granite walls. The north side had a gentle slope with a sandy beach. The road used to link to the town via a narrow, winding lane through granite rocks. There were no homes on that road, and now it was close to cars. Christy drove her white Mercedes along the smooth road built four years ago. It connected the eastern edge of town to the east side of the lakefront road. From her research, Christy learned about Tyson Kane's accident. His car was hit by a train at an old crossing. Two troubled high school students bullied by their peers were involved. One was the son of a railroad worker, the other the son of a construction foreman. They planned to get back at the town they felt had failed them. They stole an old engine and a flatbed car loaded with explosives. They drove the train onto an old track that led through the countryside and past the lake, aiming to reach the town and blow it up. But instead, they hit Tyson's car, tearing it in two. He was thrown out of the driver's seat and landed in a ditch. The car went under the train, making it go off the tracks a bit further east. Tyson's wife and the two young men died, but the explosives did not blow up. Since it was a quiet and lonely place with very little traffic, no one saw the crash or knew it happened. Two hours later, the student's message automatically posted online, explaining their plan and why they did it. The town's police got alerted and sent their three cars to check things out. Ninety minutes later, a cop found Tyson in the ditch, barely alive. That's when everything really went bad. As Tyson was rushed to the hospital, emergency workers found the train on its side and the brush further down the tracks. The two young men's bodies were mostly whole, but not a Manny's. A bomb squad came to take apart the explosives. Christy read about how GRT Corporation, the owners of the local freight railway, got into big trouble both legally and publicly. They had to give a lot of money to the survivor, Mr. Kane, and to the town. GRT quickly started a project to remove the tracks from the branch line. Rusty rails and old wooden ties were pulled up and taken away. Then road workers leveled the ground and laid a nice six-foot-wide asphalt path from the crash site to the town's edge. They refused to remove the tracks within the town. With permits from the town council, those road crews built the smooth two-lane road Christie was using. When it was done, the town council closed the old lane to vehicles, making it part of the trail system. Since it linked to the town's edge, the whole path formed a 15-mile loop. Like any new project, the town's leaders got involved. 